Welcome to module three of the credit strategies reading in fixed income. Here, the curriculum turns to look at methods that fund managers use to select bonds, to identify undervalued bonds to buy and overvalued bonds to sell. Um, looks at it from a bottom up basis where we uh, consider individual securities, the merits of individual securities. And then we come at it from a top down basis where we consider the merits of different markets and sectors. Uh, and along the way, we're going to discuss a couple of models and a couple of ideas as well. So let's get started. Um, a manager, a fixed income manager, this isn't unique to fixed income. This could be any, um, this could be any asset class. A manager can either be bottom up or top down with regards to how they construct their portfolio. A bottom up manager tends to look at individual securities, the merits of individual securities uh, first, rather than considering the macro picture, the top down picture, the big picture of a market or a sector or a, um, uh, you know, a, a, uh, an industrial sector or a class of issuer, that sort of thing. So here we're really focusing on finding the best issuers. And once we've found them, finding the best individual bond investments. Uh, we do need to define the universe that we're interested in, and we do need to divide it into sectors, location. Uh, we might even, from a bottom-up perspective, think about um, misvaluations between sectors, geographies, industries, or credit rating, for example. Um, although it's done from a bottom-up perspective rather than thinking about top-down aggregate numbers. So, of course, the um, foundation of what we're doing is we're trying to assess the uh, credit riskiness of an issuer and uh, from a bottom-up basis we'll tend to look at some very fundamental information um, like the business of the issuer, um, their competitive position, their business model, um, their brand, their management quality, that sort of thing because of course all of this goes into the long-term health of the company and their ability to pay back their debts. We'll also be looking at financial ratios as well along the way just crunching some numbers with regards to profitability Obviously, we want high profitability, everything else equal, relatively low leverage, everything else equal, all right, um, because that suggests less chance of financial distress and decent liquidity. Um, in other words, decent cash generation by firms so that they've got cash available to pay their, their debts when they come due. Um, obviously, that's a very sort of qualitative assessment of the, um, the borrower's position. Uh, we do have more quantitative models out there to estimate probability of default and loss given default, which are the two core ingredients of credit risk. You might remember these from level two. In fact, they might send a chill down your spine. Don't worry, we're not going to uh, we're not going to get um, go into the weeds with these at level three. We're just going to acknowledge that we remember, we recall, or at least we have um, battle scars from. At level two discussing structural models for assessing probability of default and loss given default and reduced form models they're two different approaches for assessing our probability of default what i refer to as pod um, and the loss given default the structural model is a is a um, it's a fundamental approach in so much as it looks to model the paths that the assets of the borrower can go down and obviously, the fundamental idea here is that we default when we can't afford our debt. Uh, we can't afford our debts, so we default when our assets are less than our liabilities. All right. And what we're doing here is we're modelling what assets could do. You know, in terms of different paths they could go down as like a random process. Assets could go up. Assets could go up and then come down. You know, we're modelling where assets, what assets could do, getting a distribution of final. Um, uh, values for our assets and uh, thinking about how often how often and what the impact is of falling below our liabilities all right so if our liabilities are here we're really building if you can think about this as like a distribution on its side we're building a distribution of potential um, end values for our assets and um, and thinking about the area in that tail that would represent the probability of default all right and you know loss given default would really be linked to how far assets could fall below what we owe because of course um, lenders are not going to get that back um, this here you might look at this and think that's very much like a sort of a black shoals framework you know modeling something as a random process thinking about where it might end up relative to a fixed strike it's very much like what black shoals did and of course don't forget it was merton that pioneered the, st the structural model approach um, so it was a black shoals type random process 
uh, that we use to model assets versus liabilities and to assess the probability of default, probability of falling into this um, area of the tail here, and uh, the um, and the, 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 if you like the, how far into the tail we could go. Um, we're also, uh, by the way, we can also think about if we can get this kind of dispersion of asset prices, we can think about the volatility of the assets. We can think about how far away we are from defaulting in terms of volatility of the assets. Uh, this here might be referred to as the cushion, the equity cushion, how far we are away from defaulting, away from our liabilities. Um, and, you know, the bigger this cushion, the, the bigger the distance to default, DTD. And so this is an extension of this analysis. We can think the higher the DTD, the distance to default, maybe we're you know, uh, one standard deviation away in terms of asset value or two standard deviations, three. The higher that distance, the lower the probability of default, what I call POD. Um, Moody's expected default frequency uses this idea. Um, in very simple terms, Moody's expected default frequency would assess the distance to default of different firms and then look at how many of them actually default. It's a very simple idea. So whilst we're using this sophisticated analysis to identify distance to default in terms of standard deviations or volatility of the assets, once we've got that, we can look at all of our issuers with a distance to default, say, two standard deviations or broadly two. And we can think, well, you know what? About 3% of them default. So that gives us an expected default frequency, which informs our, our understanding of probability of default for that particular distance to default. OK, so look, you won't be doing any of this, but we're just kind of, if you like, we're just kind of reviewing these ideas. Um, the structural model looks at modeling assets versus liabilities and is very fundamental in that sense. Um, you could be a little bit broader than that. You could take a step back and say there are these key variables like macroeconomic conditions which feed into um, spreads. Um, you know, macroeconomic conditions flow through into probability of default and loss given default. And we're looking for a function which links. Maybe we model macroeconomic conditions as a random process or you know, there's a likelihood we could improve or deteriorate, that sort of thing. And that informs our understanding of probability default and loss given default. And that, in turn, informs our understanding of what the fair spread should be. Um, these macroeconomic conditions could be top down. They could even be, as we're about to see, um, uh, um, with uh, um, kind of like a an old version of a, of a reduced form model. Uh, we're going to look at... Um, uh, the Altman Z score uh, that you can argue that's reduced form, but it's more fundamental than looking at overall macroeconomic conditions, um, fundamental in terms of the uh, financial ratios of an issuer. But um, the general idea is that we can use conditions or features of a borrower to inform our POD, uh, um, our probability of default and our loss given default, which inform therefore informs our spread. Now, don't forget, we did say this um, earlier on. Don't forget that in general terms, the spread that you demand from a credit risky instrument should be broadly equal to, um, you know, that's approximately equal to uh, um, what you expect to lose each period. So probability default multiplied by loss given default. If you've got a periodic probability default, then you expect to lose this. This is your periodic um, credit loss in, in, you know, as a ratio. And uh, so this is what you want back. This is your risk premium. You want to be paid that back. That's only fair. You can always rearrange this and say, well, in that case, a probability default any time can be inferred by looking at spreads relative to loss given default. You know, you can argue this is a reduced form way of linking in very simple terms. You know, these these crucial um, characters in modeling credit risk. Uh, if you're looking for a probability default in, uh, implied by a spread, all you need to do is to assess loss given default and vice versa. If you've got these two ingredients, you can assess what a fair spread for an issue is. Um, but you don't have to go through this, this key equation. The thing about the reduced form model is that it is very flexible and you can model credit risk uh, uh, in any way that you choose. Anything that's relevant, you can, you can say that informs our um, understanding of the risk of default and the impact of default. So here's a very early version of a reduced form model. It's the Altman Z-score model. Um, to give you an idea of how this model works, these are the inputs. They're very fundamental inputs. Um, in terms of being crucial financial ratios, credit related financial ratios of an issuer. Um, first one is working capital, that's current assets over current liabilities as a proportion of your total assets. The higher that is, the more liquid your assets are. Then you've got retained earnings in equity versus your total assets. The higher that is, the, uh, the more of your earnings you're holding back and you're not paying out as dividend. 
So the more firepower you've got in the firm rather than having paid it out. Then you've got EBIT over total assets. That's like your um, return on assets, isn't it? Operating return on assets. The higher that is, the more profitable you are. Down here, you've got sales over total assets. That's your total asset turnover. The higher this is, the more productive you are. And then you've got the market value of equity versus total liabilities, the book value of total liabilities. The higher this is, the more valuable the market thinks your company is, um, you know, even though it's got some debt, you know, per unit of debt, if you like. So obviously, the higher these factors, um, the better off the company is. <clears throat> and what the Alton Z score does is it gives you a formula. It says the Z score is, I think it's 1.2 times the first one. Uh, 1.4 times the second one and so on. I don't think the coefficients, you can see them in their notes, I don't think the coefficients are important. Um, the crucial thing is that the Z score is a calculation based on these inputs. It's based, you, you get these coefficients through regression, okay? And that's how Altman got them anyway. Um, it's a calculation of a score based on, a score based on these metrics, these fundamental metrics. Um, I think what's more important for your exam is the interpretation of the output. So the interpretation of the Z-score is the important thing. If your Z-score is above 3, low chance of default. If it's below 1.8, then actually you're in the default zone. Between 1.8 and 3 inclusive, um, it's really no comment. Some risk of default is not really committal. It's a grey zone. So no comment really. We can't really tell. And, you know, Altman built this model through regressing these key characteristics um, against... Um, key outcomes with regards to probability of default, loss given default, that sort of thing. Okay. So I wouldn't worry. I know if I was sitting in your position, I'd be thinking, should I learn that model and so on with all these coefficients? Um, I, I would put that to the back of the queue with regards to what you need to know. Knowing the um, knowing the uh, uh, the the CFA, they're probably not going to reward people for memorizing these rather sort of perfunctory coefficients. Um, of these factors to calculate the z-score they'll probably give you the model maybe ask you to apply the model given some input data which you can do you can lift you know the numbers if uh, current assets are you know 10 and current liabilities are far uh, you know let's call it six and total assets are 50 you know you can do that you know 10 minus 6 is 4 divided by 50 is you know 4 divided by 50 okay um, 0. Uh, what is it? Zero point zero eight, something like that. Eight percent. Yeah. So you can do that and put that into the model that they give you, and um, and then you know come out with the Z score. The important thing is interpreting it. It's very within their rights, well within their rights to assume that you can interpret the output of the model. And a higher score is better. A lower score is worse and increases. You know, takes you into the likely to default zone if it's less than one point eight. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at an example in the curriculum with regards to bottom-up relative value analysis. And we're going to revisit this um, interpolation idea again. So it's a good chance to revisit that. Uh, here's some uh, information about a, an issuer. Um, and they've got different bonds with different maturities. And there's government bonds with different maturities as well. Now, for me, the trickiest thing about this example is how they present this data and realizing what you need to do. Um, it looks fair enough to me. You're asked to calculate the fair credit spread for a new 10-year bond issue by the corporate issuer, by the credit risk issuer. And you're told that the expectations are the new bond will offer five bits more than the... Now, this is crucial, this bit here. Five bits more than the credit spread derived from interpolating the existing credit spread curve for the issuer. Now... Um, I don't think this is a very intuitive question. I think most people, if they sort of guessed what to do here, even if they knew how to interpolate, they'd maybe guess the wrong thing. So let's spend a little bit of quality time here. Um, what have we got? I prefer to view the data um, all in one table because you might notice there's a 10 missing here and there's a 10 there, but there's a 15 missing. You know, let's see what we've got in big picture. Um, uh, let's write it all in one place. So. If we go with maturity, we've got 2, uh, 5, 10, okay, these are all listed, 2, 5, 10, 15, and 30. They're all different maturities that we're interested in. Um, have we got the, the corporate yield to maturity at these levels? If we have, we'll write them in. 
So um, yes, we've got the two year corporate, that's um, 0.9. Uh, we've got the five year and the 15 years. So we've got 1.5 here. We are missing the 10 year corporate yield, which is a big deal because we're issuing a 10 year bond. All right, and 15 we've got, that's three and a half. We don't know the 30 year corporate yield. That might not be massively important. When it comes to the benchmark, um, benchmark bonds, um, what have we got? We've got two years, um, for two, five, 10 and 30. I'm just gonna write them in two. Five. We have got 10 here and 30. So it's the 15 year one that's missing here. Now, this is where I think people, um, and I think, you know, I'm very sort of uh, sympathetic uh, if people just kind of interpolated these two yields, got a corporate yield and then subtracted the benchmark yield and stated the answer. Um, but that wouldn't be right. The reason that wouldn't be right is because we've been asked specifically to interpolate the existing credit spread curve for the issuer. So we're not interpolating, to get our answer, we might need to use interpolation here, um, but actually to get our answer, we're gonna interpolate the credit spread curve. All right, we're gonna interpolate adjacent maturities for the credit spreads to get the fair credit spread at um, 10 years. So what do I mean by that? Well, look, um, let's see what we've got in terms of credit spread. We know that the two year is 0.7, although that's not massively interesting. Five year is 0.7 as well. And that is interesting because that's right next to the 10 year we're after. We don't know this one because we're missing a data point and we don't know this one because we're missing a data point. All right, and we don't know this one either. But the crucial thing is given the way the question has been asked, um, we need to calculate this, okay? And interpolate this with the five year spread in order to calculate our implied fair 10 year spread. Okay. So kind of working backwards, what do we need? We need this. Okay. That's what we need to get the 15 year spread. So we can use the 15 year spread to interpolate the credit spread. I'll just reinforce. We've been asked to interpolate the existing credit spread curve, not the corporate yield curve. All right. Which would give a slightly different answer. So what are we going to do here? We need first thing to do is get this out. Now, um, I'm going to work, you know, if we just jump into the uh, slides, the solutions on the slides, then, um, uh, you know, we can see what's going on. But I'm going to work here because I think this is a better sort of uh, vista to see what's going on. To get this out, that's the benchmark yield for the 15 year maturity given adjacent 10 and 30 year um, uh, yields. Do you remember what we did with interpolation earlier? We're looking for weights in the 10 and the 30 year name such that those weighted averages of 10 and 30 equal 15. Do you remember what we did? We said the weight in the lower name is going to be um, the higher maturity minus what you're targeting. You're targeting here 15 in the middle divided by the higher maturity minus the lower maturity. So in this particular case, we've got a higher maturity of 30 targeting 15 and uh, the low maturity is 10. So of course this is 15 out of uh, 20. So that's 0.75. So that's the weight in the 10 year name. And uh, that means the weight in the 30 year name is going to be 0.25. So that's my way of getting the weights out nice and quickly. Of course, what you're really doing, if we go to the slide and see how the slide's doing it, um, what you're really doing when we're interpolating to get that 15 year benchmark yield, what we're really doing is we're saying we're targeting 15 with a weight in the 10 year and one minus that weight in the 30 year. So then they're using algebra, you've got 10W there minus 30W there, using algebra to come to the same conclusion. Um, if you solve here, you get minus 15 on the left hand side, you'd get uh, minus 20 on the right hand side, so W is 15 over. 20, as we said, 75%. W there is the 10 year weight. All right, now the important thing is that we then use those weights um, to calculate our interpolated 15 year benchmark yield. That's what we're doing here. So uh, let's do it, let's do it all on here so we can see what's going on. So my, my 15 year interpolated yield 
is going to be 75% uh, in the 10 year name, which has got a yield of two, plus 25% in the 30 year name, which has got a yield of four. Okay, uh, that comes out at two and a half. So closer to two than four, which makes sense because 15 is closer to 10 than 30, right? Now you can get the credit spread for the 15 year name. Three and a half minus two and a half is one. Uh, by the way, I ignored on the slide where they derived the five year credit spread because we've already done that. Yeah, we did that here, it's nice and easy. So now we're gonna interpolate one and 0.7 because that's the question that's what the question asked us to do interpolate one and 0.7 to get our um, credit spread our interpolate credit spread so look uh, at this stage you could go through the formula and stuff but sometimes you need to just look at stuff and say hang on a minute we can do this easily 10 is half the way between 5 and 15 so my spread's going to be half the way between 0.7 and 1 which is of course 0.85 okay that's what interpolation is really doing. It's moving a fraction of the way through the period. You know, it's using maturities to work out how far you are through this range, if you like. And then it goes that far through this range here from 0.7 to 1. So we can visibly see it's 0.85 there. All right. If you want it to be super um, robust here, or if you want to see how the analysis, the, the method applies, the weight in the shorter dated name would be the higher maturity minus the yeah, I've written that one, so I'm not going to write it again. So the high maturity in this example is 15 minus the target, which is 10, divided by the high maturity, which is 15, minus the low maturity, which is 5. So what do we get? 5 out of 10 here, 50%. So you're 50% in 0.7, 50% in 1. And if you work, the, work out that weight, um, that weighted average, you'll get 0.85. Now, don't forget that the bond was... Um, being issued, the new bond is being issued at a five basis points uh, premium to that credit spread that we just derived from interpolating the existing credit spread curve. That 0.85, the new bond is being issued at five bips higher than that. All right, so that would be a shame, wouldn't it, if you drop that right at the end. They're agreeing with us here. Um, if you look at the solution, they're agreeing with us here that we should take an average of 0.7 and 1. That's where the 0.85 comes in for the interpolated 5 and 15 spread, 5 and 15 year spreads. Um, don't forget, yeah, the slides hammering that home as well, which is good. Remember to add the five basis points new issue premium to that um, to state an answer of 0.9. Um, it would be a shame if you drop that right at the end there, wouldn't it? Particularly if it's one of those questions that you only just type in a number and you can't show you're working in this new computer-based world that we live in. Okay, so all of this was bottom-up analysis. Uh, a top-down analysis, of course, can always be done. And really, you'd find that managers will be doing both a bottom-up relative value analysis and um, they'll be setting their overall strategic and tactical asset allocations for different markets, different types of bonds, different types of issuers, different credit ratings, um, using a top-down approach, um, thinking about where it's best to be. So rather than what's the best individual security, which is what a bottom-up approach did, here we're looking at where's the best place to be. And we're going to think about you know the, econ the economic cycle, where corporate profits are good. That will inform us as to when we should take credit risk when things are bad, get out of high yield. When things are good, get back into high yield, essentially, or before and that's priced into markets. Remember, stronger growth means spreads narrow, so we move into high yield names, which benefit more from uh, more contraction of spreads. Okay, spreads contract; these credit risky names will outperform. Um, also, maybe doing relative value on a sector basis. You can do that on a top-down basis at the aggregate level here. So very much like we were discussing the, the credit cycle in the first reading in this chapter, uh, we can think about where we are, what we expect to happen. You can generally say that, and we'll do this later on when we apply strategies, you can generally say that if we think the uh, economy is going to worsen, then we would expect spreads to rise generally and for credit curves to flatten. Okay. Um, remember, there's an inverse relationship between growth and default. So as growth shrinks, default picks up and credit spreads rise along with this increased probability of default. Now, when you're assessing the level of credit risk, actually, um, we know we've got our credit rating systems. Um, they're not massively sophisticated, are they? Just these 
list of letters. Um, uh, we don't really, whilst it's ordinal, um, in other words, it gives us, you know, uh, uh, an order for names. It's not necessarily um, a good, uh, it's not very necessarily a good labeling system from a kind of a, a ratio perspective. You know, the distance between, in terms of credit risk, the distance between a double A name and a treble A name is not necessarily the same as the distance between a treble B name and a double B name. In fact, we do tend to find, practically speaking, that the probability default um, does pick up in a non-linear way as we move down these credit ratings. So there might be an argument for using a non-linear system to measure uh, probability of default or risk of default. As we move down these credit ratings, uh, we might give our credit risk or risk of default a score. A simple score might be one to eight, but that's probably not sensible because what we find in reality is the risk of default goes up in a non-linear way. This is what we mean by non-linear. It's not a straight line, okay? Uh, it's gradient changes. So it might be better to score the risk of default as say very low here um, and uh, it picks up in uh, marginally increasing uh, intervals. You can see the distance between uh, two and, uh, excuse me, distance between uh, 20 and 120 is a lot bigger than distance between 20 and one. When we move from, you know, double A to A, that's a bigger jump than when we move from double A to, uh, from treble A, okay? Um, you'll notice there's a very big jump here, treble B to double B. Of course, that's where we go from investment grade to high yield. Um, we kind of go up by a factor of three or four times here, whereas we kind of double once we move into the um, high yield sector. We're kind of doubling, aren't we? And that's the kind of order. So the key point to take away from this uh, particular part of the reading is that it might be better to measure the risk of default in a non-linear way with like this scoring system than uh, using the letters which you know don't have any numerical value um, or just a simple score which suggests similar distance between rankings which there isn't um, in reality. Okay finally here from a top-down perspective we note that increasingly in fixed income um, in, analysts are moving towards explaining returns through uh, systematic factors that carry risk premiums rather than thinking about broad labels of asset classes. This has been going on in equity markets for a long time and uh, it's recently picked up in fixed income markets as well. In fact, the curriculum cites a relatively recent report which identifies four factors which seem to carry a risk premium in fixed income. Remember, factors are just uh, risk factors where you could lose money and um, you know there's downsides, so um, markets carry a risk premium at, uh, in compensation for that downside. When we're looking in equity, we found risk premiums due to general sort of systematic risk, like equity market risk with CAPM. Farmer and French went on to find risk premiums to do with size and value. Um, so um, are there equivalent factors in fixed income markets? And the answer is yes, uh, there are. Um, there's four major ones that were published in a report, um, a recent report. Value is a factor that we can transfer over to fixed income. Um, if they've got a low market value versus um, a fundamental value, then you, the, the, that security, um, that investment carries a risk premium. You can actually use your excess spread here. Identify that we that we discussed in the last module. Identify high access spread, and you found a security with a low market value versus where it should be, fundamental or intrinsic value. Uh, momentum is a factor we use in all sorts of markets. You can apply that in fixed income as well. Momentum really is just a uh, market inefficiency factor, isn't it? It's saying if something's going up, it's going to keep going up, so buy it because uh, markets adjust slowly. And if something's going down, it's going to keep going down because it's adjusting slowly to, to new news instead of old news, slowly, right? And so sell things that are going down. Um, a defensive factor is identified here. Defensive in terms of finding um, lower risk issuers. So we might look at uh, issuers that are highly profitable have low levels of leverage. Um, that's what we might be looking for here in terms of our defensive factors. Um, and also looking for uh, low duration assets. Um, this defensive factor it is alluded to in other markets. Um, we tend to find that it's you get a better risk return trade off if you invest in low risk assets and then gear up um, versus if you just invested in uh, a high risk asset, took an ungeared investment in a high risk asset. Uh, it seems maybe there's an aversion to leverage, maybe because most people think leverage is risky. 
they don't want to gear into a low risk asset to generate say a 10% return they'd rather just buy something that generates 10% um, and actually you get a better risk return trade-off if you gear up a low risk asset versus if you just buy an ungeared high risk asset okay um, the first factor here the, the carry factor um, is really just the expected return if you carry the position through an investment horizon and you have unchanged uh, conditions so here uh, the carry factor is really just relying on stable markets we're used to carry, we're used to um, uh, earning carry in um, foreign exchange aren't we by borrowing in a low interest rate and depositing in a high interest rate currency it's a similar idea here uh, we could um, borrow in a low interest rate um, environment and deposit in a high interest rate high yield environment and if things don't stay this you know if things don't change then we earn the carry um, broadly based on the OAS um, you know the spread that you're earning uh, for carrying a credit risky position versus a non credit risky position there are also uh, ESG environmental social and governance factors that managers could incorporate into the construction of their portfolio um, we do you know this is once again a general idea that can be applied across multiple asset classes it's not unique to fixed income we could negatively screen out the vices here uh, you know the tobacco firms the gambling firms the, uh, the alcohol firms we could screen out defense firms on the basis that you know um, uh, generating weapons you know we can screen out firms that aren't doing the right thing from a climate perspective or from a social perspective uh, thinking of um, you know sweatshops and supply chains that sort of thing we could look at ESG ratings uh, you'll find that credit rating agencies are starting to put out ESG ratings and there are firms being set up to focus on ESG ratings so a manager could be filtering or you know using these ratings to construct their portfolio a manager could even be directly investing in green bonds uh, we, the proceeds of which are used explicitly to fund ESG specific initiatives you know to do with maybe alleviating climate change green energy that sort of thing or maybe even mitigating the impact of climate change you know improving flood defenses uh, that sort of thing okay that completes module three of the credit strategies reading in fixed income